and right now it's time for that time when we talk to our special guest. Tonight's special guest is Sir Robert Jones. As a boy growing up in Nainai, Lower Hutt, he was known simply as Bob. He has had a wonderful journey of business success and political drama, starting with the New Zealand Party in 1983. We can now confidently say that its founder changed the course of New Zealand political history. We welcome Sir Robert Jones as our special guest on The Beat Goes On. Welcome to The Beat Goes On, Sir Robert Jones. Thank welcome. you, Jared. Wonderful to have you. Um, well, thank you. The introduction, however, was very kind, but uh, two, two interesting inaccuracies. One, the <laughs> Nainai old, old boy. Now, I grew up three miles from Nainai, and I worked out, I think I've been to Nainai six times in my life. And, um, but no, it's no. It's like telling I'm not a property developer. Yeah. I say to journalists, look, it's not hard. A property developer develops, an investor mm. invests. What, and what was the other inaccuracy? Well, the other one was you referred to me as a businessman. And, and um, to be frank, I'm not. I, I would say that uh, on average, I wouldn't spend more than 30 minutes a week on it. It's an interesting hobby. We've got mm. great staff. What are you then, Sir Robert? I spend my time reading, I play sport, I travel, I do all sorts of things. Because from an early age, I, yeah, I just wanted to touch and taste everything. And um, going to Nainai College, that's the Nainai State House boy, which was uh, an oddity insofar as Nainai College is not in Nainai. <laughs> but, and it should never have been called Nainai College. Um, but being a foundation pupil back in the 50s, it was pretty wild in that. You know, they, were all, well, they all wanted to leave and go into the factories, the original few hundred, which is what they duly did at 15, as you could then. Mm. And we ended up with 11 in our first sixth form. And in our first history year, we had personal tutorage. I think there were six of us, and we had the most wonderful teacher. He, he, he spent the first few hours with us, you know, in several lessons, mm. trying to persuade, didn't have to try, uh, but uh, explaining to us why absolutely everything is interesting, and it is. Now, Bob, you've re-emerged back in the public eye. You now have a column in the Herald. How did that come about? The New Zealand Herald. We see you every week now. Yes. Uh, well, I actually got my first newspaper column back in 1966 in the Hutt News. And I, but if you like reading, you like writing, you know, I handwrite everything. And, um, and I love it. And I've always had a column, actually. But what, what happened when I was approached uh, in 1987 by Fairfax, or it was Independent News then, owned by Murdoch back then, would I write a column for them? And I said, well, if I'm going to go to that effort, you've got to put it in all your papers. Well, they went further. They sold it to everyone as well. <laughs> the Herald, everyone. So it was in every newspaper in New Zealand each week, excluding Nelson, because the proprietor had some snitcher against me and didn't <laughs> want it. It's fine. Yeah, I didn't care. But, Nelson's lost, Bob. But I, I said to them then, I think I could only do it for a while because I think he gets stale and repetitious. And I did it for about five or six years, and, and I enjoyed it. But... Um, but so I, I then stopped, and they all complained. Oh, but it's very popular. I said, well, that's nice, but it's irrelevant to my po why I'm pulling stumps. But and then they approached me, would I do it again? And I said, yep, I'll do it again because I had been writing for small circulation yeah. things, so I thought I'd do it again. And you know, I like to make a point you do. and do it with humour. And, and you do it so well, yeah. and, well, that's kind of you. Mm. But to do it with humour, mm. he said, I said, what, how, what are you giving me? He said. 800 ish, seven, 800 words, something like that, seven to, you know, which means 750 to 900. Again, the technology isn't it amazing. I handwrite something out, the first draft. I'll give it to, uh, I'll go into town, give it to the secretary. And now they push a button, how many words there? And it could be 1,100. And I, when I first, when this particular girl first started doing it, I said, you watch how without changing anything, removing anything, we get 800 words. Now, when they say that, they don't care I didn't, 850, but I give them exactly 800, not 790. <laughs> and it's an interesting challenge not to remove anything. And thus, the effect of that is it ends up being very tightly written and flows well. Mm. And people say, oh, you write well. I only, if they gave me my head, they wouldn't say I write well because I wouldn't <laughs> be writing well. <laughs> no. You know, if I didn't have that discipline to get it down to that. I'd love to hear your thoughts and feelings of where we're heading now political. Where's mm. it all going now, Bob? Are you, are you happy with the progress we've made? or And why are we lingering in this recession? For well, of course, oh, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Look, uh, I recall driving with a very wealthy friend. He had a chauffeur and a Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce. And we drive up to North Wales to see this fellow in a village. And he had a little cottage industry he'd mm. bought up. All the time, newspapers. He would sell people the times on the day they were born. And it may be that he, they might have wanted the next day when their name may have been in it. Who knows? But uh, but no. But just so they say, well, the day I was born, here was the world then. Yeah. 
Anyway, it was interesting. And I went up there and I said, I'll tell you what, I'll buy the lot off you, which I did. And we took them back in cases in the back of this rolls. And I've yet to properly unwrap it, but periodically I've opened it. There were a whole lot of mm. uh, car cardboard cartons mm. and I shipped them back to New Zealand. But I've opened them at random, 1882, 1852, 18, 19, whatever. Mm. And it's the same story. Same story. Woe is yeah. us. We're <laughs> economically ruined. The world's coming to an end. I mean, look at the Herald. They've got a fellow called Bernard, somebody or other, who writes the economic com. Now, it's like, he should kill himself. I'm serious. I mean, I remember, I remember reading once. It's years all ago, What's his name? Bernard somebody, H H Hickey or something. I mean, what an appalling outlook on life. He can only ever see, the see oh, it's all doomed and everything, everyone's rotten. And what's well, not true. And you go out there and life's bustling on and you can get cantankerous or I'm called, because of my age, curmudgeon -y, if I carry on about all these apes walking around staring at these bloody cell phones, uh, the mindlessness of it all. But um, The very fact that uh, when we watch the news at night we get to the first... 30 minutes is every doom and gloom story in New Zealand. So after a while, as the years go by, if you get fed this constant diet of doom and gloom every night, you start, people then start... The, well, that's a fair point. They get, would have an effect. Young affair. people come up to me and they say that they wouldn't have a baby in this terrible world. And, well, and I've got plenty to go around there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a series coming up on television about, they're called Preppers. The whole day is preparing mm. For the end of the world. What always fascinates me is is how they instantly get so many subscribers. You recall that uh, one, in, uh, the Christian one in uh, California. What was it two years ago? Mm -hmm. And he gave the date in the streets That's of right. New York and everywhere. They're out there, and people were selling their homes, and people were making all sorts of rash mm -hmm. decisions as a result. But um, it's amazing how yeah, you know, Briley always used to say to me because mm -hmm. you know apropos of what I said earlier, that I wanted to experience everything. He said, look, it's inevitable, you'll buy it, you'll start a religion one day. But the founder of Scientology always said that. He was a science fiction writer and he said the best way to make money in the world is to start a religion. He was an interesting fellow. The, you know, it's not a genre that interests me. I don't read science fiction, but I gather that he's, he's highly regarded for his stuff. He, at one stage, he, he bought a ship. Right. Uh, they were getting pe persecuted, really. He had a huge mansion in Britain. They were going cheap in those days. They've all been converted to apartments and hotels now. But um, <laughs> but he, he was being pe persecuted a bit. So he bought a, a redundant ocean liner and he filled it up with his followers and they turned around ports and they'd go ashore dishing out their, their pamphlets and things. And um, But apparently it, it was a great spectacle. You could go down there during the daytime and anyone who stepped out of line had to walk the plank. Literally, <laughs> this bloody plank like the pirates ships of ships. I'll tell you something talking about Scientologists. He probably did have a sense of humour. I was sitting and well, standing, uh, it was the point actually, pacing up and down. We were having a meeting in our Sydney office once. And then I looked out the window and I saw a couple of young fellas and they kept darting into the crowds that were moving along. And I was watching them spotting the people they were hitting on. And what are they selling? What was it? They, they, they bail them up and they talk, talk, and every now and again, off around the corner, one of them go with that person. What were they selling? But they were studying the crowds and they knew exactly who to target. And, and that in itself fascinated me. So I, I ordered one of the bloody young fellows in the office to go down and find out what they're about. He came back and he said, oh, they're Scientologists. And then we studied it more. And of course, they were just around the corner. Who were they picking on, Jared? They were picking on backpackers, kids, from, lonely people from overseas. You know, anyone yes, to talk exactly. to. Why would anyone buy into this rubbish? You know, but then why do they buy into religion? Well, <laughs> that raises different questions of fear, of death, and all sorts of things. It's 39. coming to that time where we've got about five thousand days left. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Any thoughts that there may be another world, or you're heading somewhere, or? Absolutely, no it? doubt there's not. There's certainly no evidence of any, but I do enjoy teasing the religious. In fact, I, I, I did more than I get elated out of it. I love taking that mickey out of. What's Bob Jones been all about? What's the purpose of Bob? What I said, I, uh, right from the start, I wanted a taste, and that's why I've been to so many countries. I've lost that a bit now. Um, but, uh, you know, I could never go away for more than a couple of weeks and then I get a bit fretty what's happening. And I, I did try looking at computers and hotels. You could live in any country in the world, couldn't you? Why, why do you remain in New Zealand when... Uh, that's a common question. Um, 
That's because it's home and it doesn't mm. matter. But I've got 50 acres of garden. I love it. I, I, I love my gardens, my library, and the, you know, their friends, involvements are here. It doesn't matter. But I was grilled about that recently at a lunch with some folk, and he said, well, come on, there must be one part. Well, well, then he said, OK, you don't have to learn it, but which is probably the best country in the world? I said, I don't think there's any doubt about what, but they've all got their strengths and things, but the best country probably, except it's buggered up by religion, and that's Lebanon. Lebanon's a wonderful place, uh, but yeah. the, the religion, of course, the, mm. causes so much strife there. It's got everything, every physical thing, and a wonderful history, but, uh, and it's small. Bob, I want to know, um, turned 65 last week, and so I've got the pension now, so I want to know, Bob, what do you do with your pension? I don't take bloody pension. <laughs> Dear. Me. Have you what ever applied for it, Bob? No, of course. Well, <laughs> if I don't take it, obviously. I, I, but but I, if, last year, what's his name? He's, he's a nice enough fellow. He writes a right-wing blog. Not that I look at it. Someone, one of the secretaries showed me when I came in one day. But um, And he was saying, writing about, you know, we shouldn't be paying to wealthy people and that. And then he had a photo of me, and I said, well, this is a bit rich, and I wrote to him. I said, look, before you, you know, this if I would take it or did take <laughs> no, it. I, and, no, and, no but, <laughs> but then I said, look, I'm not going to complain too loudly because I know wealthy friends who do take it, and I'm yes. bewildered why they take it. Why They go into a queue, for God's sake. Yeah. Why? I mean, it's, it's silly. And then they used to do this silly line about, oh, I've paid my taxes. Well, they've had more than their share out of it mm. after we've run deficit mm. governments for so many years. But... Yeah. It's a weak rationalisation. What is that mentality? That, Pardon? What is that mentality? They've got all the money in the world and yet they still apply for the pension. Explain I don't understand it. I just yeah. don't. I can think of one character in particular and his wife berated him no end, but on about I paid my taxes. and I'm bewildered by it, Jared. I just mm. don't understand. He's a generous man. He's liberal. He enjoys travel. He, I imagine, travels first class. Yes, he does. I've travelled with him once into Vietnam. Uh, we went together, a bunch of four of us. Um, and uh, he spares no expense, so uh, he certainly doesn't need it. I don't understand it. Uh, Bob, we have to finish. Gosh, it's been great talking to you. No, it's been uh, nice here. Uh, what I'd like to do before you go is you've got some wonderful books out there. The books are Degrees for Everyone. Yep, it's a novel. Memories of Muldoon, mm -hmm. that'll be funny. And uh, It is funny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> true, true facts. They're all funny. So we need um, a question, uh, Bob. Yeah. What about... What about as an answer your full name? What's your full name, uh, Bob? Robert, Robert Edward. Robert Edward. Okay. Robert Edward Jones. That's the answer. And get them into Jared at the beat goes on dot co dot NZ and you could win one of these wonderful yeah. books. You're too generous. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sir Robert. Okay, it's been nice. Bye bye.